together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for a new day. Thank you for our life. None of us chose to be alive. Thank you that we get to experience you, to know you. And thank you that we get to do it together. So we make ourselves aware of your presence now. Ask that you would show yourself to us. We know you're here. We know you're in our midst. Lord, help us be aware of you. Help us to sense you, to hear your voice, to see your face in the faces of others. We come to you as we are. We come to you as we are. Just honest. Maybe feeling distracted or not really prepared. Maybe so happy we can't concentrate. as we are, Lord, in your presence. Thank you that we're welcome.
song says, I will praise you, O my Redeemer, someone who's bought us back, that, our, that he owns us, that we don't belong to ourselves. And this slavery to him actually makes us free. implies looking back. We've been redeemed from something. Maybe take a moment to look back on your life. What has Jesus redeemed you from? Where were you? Where are you now? Man, I think of the guilt. I think of the shame. Think of the secrets. Think of the broken relationships. Think of all the people who love me that I hurt. think that when Jesus came in, when I met him, when he arrested me and stopped me, I remember that burden going away. I remember feeling free. Do you remember feeling that way? Do you remember the feeling? Can you pull up that feeling? I remember humbling myself to people and saying, I'm sorry. That's all parts of healing. Hmm. The feeling of being forgiven. feeling of being made right. And we can have it now too. Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if I don't praise your name, even the rocks would cry out if I don't praise your name, even the mountains will shout. Oh, that would be tragic, wouldn't it? If I don't praise your name, even the rocks will cry out. If I don't praise your name, even the mountains will shout. So I will praise your name, and now the rocks don't need to cry out. So I will praise your name, no need for the mountains to shout, yeah, yeah, yeah.
heart longs. My heart longs for the living God. My heart longs for you alone. My heart longs for the living God alone. And so we praise, praise. We lift our voice and raise praise. I sing of your My soul thirsts, my soul thirsts for the living God, for you alone. My soul thirsts for you alone. My soul thirsts for the living God alone. And so we praise, praise. I lift my voice and raise praise. I sing of your amazing grace to you, the living God. To you, the living God. And why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why do you doubt? Oh, my soul, just put your hope in God. Oh, my soul. You sing it right to yourself. Why are you cast down? Oh, my soul, why do you doubt? Oh, my soul, put your hope in God. Oh, my soul, for I will be glad, and so we praise, praise. I lift my voice and raise, praise. We sing of your amazing grace to you, the living God. And so we praise. and raise praise we sing of your amazing grace to you the living God to you the living God to you the living God amazing grace sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And so we praise, praise. I lift my voice and raise praise. We sing of your amazing grace to you, the living God. You the living God to you the living God to you the living God Lord thank you that you're alive that you're here and that you've saved us Lord so destitute we were so without hope you found us, Lord. We pray that you would find us again, that you would 
even speak today into the darkness, the hidden places. Lord, bring us awake to who you are even more today. May we be closer to you today than when we first came. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Check, check. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm uh, Jameson. I'm here to give you an announcement. <clears throat> it's a short, short announcement list today. I don't even think we got one, a slide for it. The only announcement today is that after service, we have members of the Union Gospel Mission here to present a uh, Engaging Homelessness 101. And I attended this a similar uh, presentation in the U District a few weeks ago. And the Lord just told me, this is where I want you. And I have unarguable peace about that and I think it's so precious to know we're where the Lord wants us to be I know that isn't always the case um, so it's good to know this is the groove that he wants me to um, ride in for a bit and and I'm good with that because it's it's a blessing so uh, after Mike gets done with the sermon uh, we're going to have lunch and then we're going to come down and sit down and, and Pay attention to the presentation, and there will probably be people coming over from Emmanuel, and I think they actually put an invite out to the neighborhood, but I'm not sure if anybody else will be coming through, but we're just going to settle in and, and get down to it, so it'll be a bit of a quick shuffle, um, not a bunch of him hawing around, Paul Shaner. Thanks, brother. Thanks, brother. Uh, but I wanted to uh, share this scripture, and then... Uh, and then we'll do a, a slide presentation, and, and Mike will come up, and we'll just carry on. But uh, this is from Psalm 90, and Moses is praying. And I think it, uh, you, you tell me, well, I guess you tell the Lord if that fits with you or not. Just listen to these words. Moses is praying, and he says, Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad how all of our days make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their, our children. Let the favor of our Lord God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. During that time, uh, it just seemed natural that a nine and a half year old would crave cigarettes and beer. And, um, you know, my, my bed was on a second shelf of a bar. When I came to America, I um, battled uh, a terrible withdrawal, and my fingers were stained black from handling opium um, and stoking opium pipes for, you know, not only the soldiers, but even our own Vietnamese people in the dens. I was nine and a half. One of the first families they've shared with me that I would, you know, wake up um, almost every night for a year would just, um, you know, be crying and eyes swollen shut from the salt and, uh, and the battling of um, the drawing of opiates. You know, for my addiction through the years, it's, it was carrying the guilt of forgetting my mother's name and my sister's name through this whole traumatic incident. And, and um, you know, all the drugs in the world couldn't, couldn't mask that. But boy, at least 35 years of my life that I battled easily with drugs and alcohol. There are times I look in the mirror and see that my eyes are clear and it's just, um, I never thought that would ever happen. It was just allowing me the space and time to slowly heal. And, uh, and more importantly, just being around the gospel of Jesus Christ really motivated and kind of nurtured that growth.
working with our men and women really is the biggest motivation for me and also our homeless neighbors, our homeless guests that we serve. 880,000 meals a year. Getting married soon, uh, buying a house. <laughs> You know, if uh, somebody was to tell me that. By coming into here that all of this would happen, I, I would have never believed it. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Mic drop. Okay, welcome. Let's turn to uh, Luke chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 25 through 37. Luke 10, 25 through 37. And I want to welcome the Union Gospel Mission people. You guys are my heroes. Um, and I'm not, I'm not just saying that. I got a chance to work with you all when I was at another church in Bellevue and quickly gained respect and... Um, Love what you guys are doing, and I love that we can call you. Um, it's not something that they are doing. You're you're part of the body of Christ. This is a we thing, and so we're just so proud that we have Christians and we can be a part of what's going on out in our city, because a lot of us don't know what to do. That's the insecurity that I feel, and I think a lot of us feel when we see someone. We go. What do I do right now? I've got, on one hand, I've got this pull to help, but on the other hand, I have this feeling of caution. What do I do? I don't know what to do. And it's so great that you guys are here. Um, it's, it's awesome. And may this be uh, the beginning of many visits. We really hope so. Okay, we're going to be in Luke chapter 10, and I hope this dovetails nicely into your, your all um, presentation over lunch. Um, let's read the verses, and then we'll pray, and we'll get into it. Luke 10, 25 through 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? And he answered, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do that, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. <clears throat> so he answered, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And in reply to that, Jesus said, well, a man was going down from J Jerusalem to Jericho, when he was attacked by robbers, and they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went, and went away, leaving him half dead. And a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Also, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring, in, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you. I will reimburse you any extra expense that you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law replied, well, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do that. Go and do likewise. Lord, would you, gosh, these words are already ringing in my heart and in my soul. They're already starting to convict me. They're already starting to hurt me in all the right ways. Um, I pray that you would help us to push into what you say. It's like staring directly into the sun at times. Lord, help us to feel the warmth, to know your good, Lord, and to sense your exhortation in these, in these words. 
Um, I pray that you'd anoint the, the speaking of your word today. These are your words, not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me give you a little context here. In the first nine chapters of the book of Luke, Luke is seeking to ask the question that's kind of buzzing on everyone's mind at this point, and that is, who is this guy? Who is Jesus? Um, And people, I will say just from a conversation I had two days ago, people are still asking that question in Seattle today. Who is Jesus? Jesus. There's a lot of opinions about that, but in Jesus' day, this dynamic, powerful rabbi comes on the scene, and he's turning the world upside down. He's causing, he's very disruptive. He's a controversial figure. When he teaches, he's not interpreting the law, but it's almost like he's speaking as the author of it. He's speaking with authority, Uh, speaking not like anyone else has ever heard the Bible being taught before. And then on top of that, he's healing people, he's restoring people, he's meeting people's needs, and some of the most dire needs that he's meeting. And there's this buzz in the air because of all this activity, because of kind of this twofold dynamic of the way he teaches, the way he speaks, and then the stuff that he does to back it up, and kind of this moral weight, this character that he's got, just when he shows up, He's got this authority to him, and people are asking, who is he? And then finally, in chapter 9, Peter says what a lot of people were thinking, certainly what Luke is trying to reveal, he proclaims, you're the Messiah. He says it. You're the one that we've been waiting for. You're the one that I've been taught about since I was old enough to even be taught. Since I was old enough to be taught anything, my parents, my culture has been telling me that a Davidic king will come, And he will reset up the throne of David in Jerusalem. And from this throne, from this city, the whole world will have peace because of this kingdom, this messianic figure that will come from the line of David. You're the one. It's you. You're the one. And and Jesus says, you're right. Good job, Simon. Simon. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father that is in heaven. So the first part of the book of Luke is working on the identity of Jesus. Who is he? Well, okay, it's been revealed now. It's out in the open. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. But the section we are dipping our toe in is the second section of the book where Luke is working on what it means for people who encounter Jesus and actually take him up on it, believe in him, and actually endeavor to follow him. And in short, he's answering the question, what does Christianity look like? How would you identify a Christian on the street? What does it mean to be a follower of this Messiah, of of Jesus? Um, Luke just ended the first nine chapters asserting that Jesus is not on the same level as any other religious founder. He's much more than a prophet. He's not just one of many. Luke has been saying this whole time, he's supreme. He depends on no one. And yet everybody, whether you realize it or not, every second is completely depending on him. This is who this is, Luke is saying. Okay? Those are the assertions that are coming out. I talked to this a couple days ago to a guy that said that Jesus never claimed to be God. Um, and, all, and, and, well, a lot of the, the uh, Latin works and the Gnostic Gospels, I think he was referring to those particular Gospels. And I asked him kindly and politely, have you read the Gospels in the Bible? Have you read the Synoptics? Have you read John? Those types of, of, of things. Because not only does Jesus flat out say it at, at, a, at, at a few points, but he strongly implies it, the, this this friend of mine was saying that he respects Jesus. And I said, well, if you don't see him as God, then how can you respect him? Because if he's not God, he's, he, he sounds like a lunatic to me with every once in a while having some really good advice, (laughs) you know, Uh, that, you know, at the best, if I didn't believe Jesus was God, I would say, well, even a blind squirrel finds a nut sometime. You know, like when when he says things like, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, we would say, okay, great. That's good job. You got one. But the other things that he says, for example, like, um, I actually happened to be there. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Like, no one, you know, imagine being around a campfire with your buddies. 
and you're telling ghost stories, and Jesus is listening. He says, oh, yeah, that's crazy. Well, this one time, like way before time actually even began, I saw Lucifer fall from heaven. I mean, you, you don't say those types of things and walk away going, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. He, he strongly implied it throughout. This is who we're talking about here, and this is the, what the Gospels present. They're presenting this Jesus who made some very, very intense claims about himself, and that's shaking up the world because of those claims. And now, for those of us that are bold enough to take him up on it, he's saying, okay, so the first half of the book's intense, the identity of Jesus. What does it mean for us to follow such an intense figure? What does it mean for us to follow? Is there a middle ground here? Is there a nice, mediocre way to go about our lives and follow someone as radical as the leader we claim to follow? That's the question. Uh, when you come to this realization, it, things change forever. And the next section of Luke is exploring the born-again experience in this life. And that is the context of this, that's the context of this famous little parable. It's a very famous parable, but that's the context. It's to show the law behind the law. Jesus, well, in the original, in, in the Greek text, it's the word nomos. In the, to a Hebrew person, they would have said Torah. He's not talking about rules. He's talking about a story, the first five books of Moses, that tell the story of God pursuing mankind, making a way for man to come in again. That's what he's talking about. And he's wanting to show us the spirit behind that, the heart behind the law, a life that has basically been transformed by mercy. Jesus tells the story, and it's crazy because this guy asks for, this is an expert in the law that is interacting with Jesus. He, he knows Torah, and he knows it, it, it you know, he, this is what he does. He knows it very well. And Jesus' first answer obviously made him uncomfortable, even though Jesus was agreeing with him. How do you read it? How would you boil down the Torah? How would you sum it up? And the guy rightly answers, to love the Lord your God with all your, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. You know what that means? It means every fiber of your being, every part of who you are, every thought, every mental capacity, every drive and desire that you have is completely and utterly dedicated and centered on God. Every waking moment of the day. How are we doing? That's what that means. So first, it's this complete, pure, 100% blank check dedication to Yahweh, to God. He is why, what I live for. And secondly, to sum up the Law and the Prophets, is this horizontal relationship between us and our fellow man, to love others the way we love ourselves. What does that mean? It means that we care about others as much as we care about ourselves. It means that I will try to endeavor to solve other people's problems with the same ingenuity, creativity, desire, energy, drive, and alacrity that I do go about solving my own problems. How are we doing? And those two things are linked. This is the Bible's anthropological purpose. This is what this is what the Bible would say. This is what mankind. This is where this is the sweet spot. This is what we were designed to do: have a right relationship with God, and from that place, love on each other. The two are linked. It's not work on one first and then work on the other. It's saying the two will flow from each other. Flow, one flows from the other. Which means you can work it backwards. How you are in your relationship is really telling to how you really are with your relationship with God. It's a litmus test. How are we doing? This is why the lawyer is super uncomfortable here. Jesus says, yeah, you're right. Go do that. And the lawyer, it says, seeking to justify himself. He's feeling super naked right now. He just got kind of exposed. Jesus said, yeah, do that. And so he's seeking to kind of have a, the last word, and he says, well, who's my neighbor? Trying to kind of, let's get nitpicky here. Let's find some rule or some algorithm or some structure that we can kind of, I can kind of get around this flashlight that's on my soul right now. He's looking for a policy. He's looking for an interpretation. But instead, Jesus gives him a story, which is, Total Jesus MO here. 
Jesus tells the story of a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, the man is mugged, robbed, stripped naked, and beat up so bad that he's barely hanging on to his life. That's how bad it is. He's barely hanging on. The story implies that unless he gets some help, he's going to die. It's a dire situation. If someone doesn't help him, he's going to lose his life. And this priest comes by, this religious person, maybe like the one that Jesus is talking to. And he's traveling by, he sees this man, sees that he's dead, or maybe in his estimation, mostly dead, or going to die. And he's beyond help, so he passes by, and he doesn't offer any assistance at all. And a Levite, which is like a Hebrew nationalist, he comes by and has the same reaction. He sees him, thinks it's too risky, this is a dangerous place, he's too far, the guy's too far gone anyway. Maybe we've had those thoughts. Uncomfortable yet? There's no hope for him. What's the use? I might as well not stop. Maybe I'll just keep driving by. Roll up my window even. And he goes by. But then a Samaritan comes along and has pity on this man. He bandages his wounds. He provides financial assistance, room and board, medical help. He takes basically total responsibility for the man's recovery. Complete responsibility. Um, And at the end of the parable, Jesus asks the lawyer, which of these three people do you think a neighbor would be? Let me, in other words, he says, let me help you. You can figure this out. You're a smart person. This is very human. Your own instincts will tell you the truth here. There's a, there's a, a, a pity inside of you that you'll be able to see. When I tell you this story, you'll be able to figure it out. And sure enough, the expert of the law interestingly says, he doesn't, here's what he doesn't say. He doesn't say the one that bandaged his wounds, the one that paid for his medical uh, expenses, the one that put him on his own donkey, the one that came back to church. He's, he puts it all under the category of one word. He says the one who has mercy, mercy on this man. That's what we're learning about today. That's what the heart, I think, if I was a spokesman for UGM, I would say mercy is what we're talking about here. This is the ministry of mercy that is baked in to Christianity. You, we cannot get away from it. That's why I say that uh, the Union Gospel Mission, it's an us, because if we're Christians, it's not like they do it and we applaud them from out from in here. Yay. No, we do it because mercy is baked into what it means to be a Christian. That's what I'm talking about first. It's built into it. And secondly, because of that, it changes the way we look at the world. It changes the grid by which we look at others. It changes by, the, this is beautiful, it changes the grid by which we look at ourselves and how we look at other people, okay? It, it'll, it'll make you see the world without barriers. Okay, let me just, let me just briefly, let me just briefly, um, if you're part of my church, you know that's kind of a joke. Let me briefly tell you the two, these two points. Mercy is, first of all, baked into Christianity. It's part of what it is. Let's, let's look, um, look again at what the Samaritan does for this man. Can anybody want to name out some things that he does? What's that? Bandages his wounds. Yes. What, what's that? Yes, put ointment on them. Yeah. Yeah, wine and oil, yeah. Yep, he, so he spends some money, gets some nice things. Absolutely. Good point. Yep, he doesn't see his uncleanness as something to be avoided. Yep. He has compassion. Yeah, love, pity, offers him friendship maybe. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, he, he lets his life be interrupted. In fact, very interrupted. Super inconvenient here, but he lets it happen. Yep. There's a priority, uh, interestingly. He, he, all of a sudden, something comes up that, that is more of a priority than what he already had going on. Yeah? Yeah, he sees it through. To the, yeah, he doesn't, just, he doesn't just give a little bit. He, he wants to see a, there's a completion here. He's got a goal in mind. He's got a vision for this man that's dying that he would be healthy again. Yep. Anyone else? Really good observations. 
Yeah, it takes, can you, okay, let me, can you imagine taking somebody to the hospital and telling the people, send the bill to me, whatever it is? Can you imagine? I mean, that's, that's what's going on. He offers him love, pity, friendship, time, money, medical treatment, advocacy, all of those things. Now, don't forget the context of this parable because it's key to understanding it. Jesus is asking, is showing this guy the essence of what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to follow Jesus. That's the whole section that Luke is going to explore in the second half of his book. And this is basically his opener. What is it? How can you see a Christian? Jesus is trying to show us the essence of that. The lawyer asks Jesus to get specific, and Jesus, he, you know, what does he bring up? Caring for the poor. Caring for the poor. Caring for people who are destitute. In the old, and what's remarkable, I was just talking to somebody the other day, at one point in, in my journey with the Lord, I decided that I would read through the Old Testament and I would find every place I could, I would mark every place where God says he cares for what scholars call the quartet of the Old Testament. The quartet are the poor, the fatherless, the widow, and the immigrant. That's the quartet, of the poor, the fatherless, the widow, and the immigrant. Those are the, the people that Jesus, or that God, Yahweh, cares for. It's by which he judges nations. It's, why, it's where prophets say you're doing good king or you're doing bad king. Kind of hinges on those, on his care for those. You guys, I did it. It was remarkable. It was remarkable how many times. I could not turn a page without circling something, marking something. And I thought, oh my gosh, I had read through the Bible at that point probably three or four times and I had missed it. I had not noticed And I had this experience of, how could I have not noticed? It's glaring. It's everywhere. He cares. And Jesus is just carrying this thing through. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He brings up, when he says, what does it mean to be a follower of Christ, a a redeemed image bearer from the Old Testament? The first thing he brings up is, you'll know them when they care for the poor. The modern church looks at mercy to the poor as a good thing, but like as an optional thing. As, or as in like some people are gifted in this. Some people have the spiritual gift of being like UGM. And, uh, you know, and, and others, we have the gift of being in church or being, you know, of, of other types of, of things. But to be honest, if that's the case, <laughs> I think maybe you guys would agree, very, not very many people have the gift if that's the case. Because the, the fields are white for harvest, and the laborers, I think, are probably pretty, pretty few here. According to this, and the rest of the Bible, this is not an option. It's not an app that you can, or a way that you can level up and get, it, this, is, this is who you are. It's like a, if you were to, you know, the vitals of a human body, they've got to be breathing, you've got to have a heartbeat. That's, that's, those things are not optional. Those things have to happen for something to be deemed alive, the same is, this is the same, this is true with Christianity. This is part of who we are. By far, the most sobering passage about this is Matthew 25. Oh, gosh, brace yourselves. Here we go. There, Jesus is describing judgment day, the end of time, when everyone will be judged by God. And Jesus says that he will divide people like sheep and like goats. And he's talking about the difference between Christians and people who say they're Christians. I'll call them wannabes, okay? The difference between Christians and wannabes. And he says to the ones who just think that they're Christians, you want to know, you want to know how I know that you really don't know me? Jesus basically is saying, this is my paraphrase, you want to know how I know? Because when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. That's how I know. When I was in prison, you didn't come visit me. When I was thirsty, you didn't come and give me water. When I was naked, you didn't put clothes on me. That's how I know. That's how I know that you don't know me, and, that, and that's how I don't know you. That's why. And the wannabes say, they're, the wannabes are dumbfounded. The people that have just said that they're followers, they're dumbfounded. They're like, Lord, what do you, I, we don't, what do you mean? In fact, they even, they even go, they kind of display a resume, did we not? prophesy in your name didn't we do these didn't we do all these things to you 
What do you mean? When did we see somebody that was naked and we didn't get? When did we, all of these things. And Jesus, he's so close to the, he identifies with them. He says, to the degree that you have not done it to the least of these, you have not done it to me. That's where I am. I'm in the eyes of the broken. I'm in the lives of the destitute. That's me. You mess with them, you mess with me. You don't know them, you don't know me. You don't tend to them and serve them, you're not serving me. Whew. Let's just let that sit a little bit. It's okay. It's, you know, this uncomfortable feeling is good. It's good. It hurts so good. And I'm feeling it too. I'm right there with you. Jesus said, these people are my people. Um, let me give you an Old Testament passage. This is from Isaiah. He says, the multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? This is the Lord speaking. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings, of rams, of the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. This would have completely confused a Hebrew person because this is what Torah required. Yahweh required burnt offerings, rams, fat, bulls, the, uh, you know, all of those sacrifices for atonement. He required that. And here, through Isaiah, he's saying, I don't, I don't like those things. Why? Because there's a spirit behind them. When you come and appear before me, he goes on, who's asked you of this? This, this trampling of my courts. Stop bringing, bringing, and here's a key word, meaningless offerings. In other words, they don't have the right intent behind them. They don't come from a right heart. Stop bringing, I'd rather you just not come. I mean, gosh, it's... Uh, in fact, when you come without meaning, it's to God, he sees it as trampling his courts. It's offensive. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. In other words, it stinks. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. Mm. Can you, I mean, can you imagine? I hate when Calvary Wallingford meets. Oh, it makes me cringe even to hear if, if my Lord said that to us. I don't think he would, but I'm just saying. Wouldn't that be, uncomfort wouldn't that be an uncomfortable moment? <laughs> I think that would be an uncomfortable moment. Um, I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my face from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. And then he's going to de define what that means. Just, you know, it's not up to us. He he'll define what right is. Here it is. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of of the fatherless and plead for the case of the widow. There it is. That's right. That's what I want, God says. That's what I want. In other words, you come to church, you bring your sacrifices, you lift up your hands, you give offerings, but this isn't what this is not this is not what I want. I want you to take care of the oppressed. I want you to take care of the orphan. It's another word for homeless. I want, you to, I want you to put people without families into a family. Do you think, um, do you think I'm taking this too far? Am I, being, am I being extreme here? I mean, I'm just reading passages to you. This is, this is one of the, you know, yeah. This is like the double-edged sword of being a preacher and what I hope to be a good preacher. Good preachers, number one, they teach the Bible, not their own opinion, but the Bible. That's good because on the one hand, I can say, not, don't shoot the messenger, here it is. But it's also hard-hitting. But it's, it's here. It's right here. Now listen, he's not saying, if you want to get to heaven, you better do this. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, 
If you've been changed by mercy, you will do this. That's what he's saying. It's, it's baked into you. He's not saying this is the way to get to heaven. He's saying if you've already been touched and saved and rescued and redeemed and you've had this experience and encounter with a merciful God, you will follow the person that you're, you will act like the person that you're following. This is just, honestly, this is just as hard hitting as it is. It's just logical. We, we act like the people that we're following. So therefore, if you're, if you're following Jesus, you're going to act more and more and more and more and more like Jesus the longer you follow him. It's, and if you, if you are acting more and more and more not like Jesus, then the question is, are we really following him? It's just, it's just logical. It's a logical argument here. That's what, that's what the Bible's saying here. We claim to follow somebody. And follow does not mean an intellectual assent to the things that he said. It's following a person. You know, when you're around somebody a lot, you start to, this is, we're social creatures. We're, 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 we start to act like the people that we're around a lot. Parents know this. When, you know, when you make the mistake of letting your kid have a sleepover four nights in a row. You know, and it's kind of like this, yeah, we can get relief, we can go on another date night, but then you get your kid back, and it's not your kid. They're acting like the other kid, they're laughing like the other kid, they're like, you know, they're, 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 they've become, in a lot of ways, the other kid. It's because it's who you hang out with a lot. It's the same with us. We generate, this is why community is so important. We become, you know, if, if, if as Jameson is serving Jesus and following Jesus, I hopefully am becoming like that. And he, and vice versa, and we're stir, the Hebrew says we're stirring each other to love and good deeds. That's what we're doing as we follow Jesus together. There's a, an inspiration. When I see the character, when I see the character in Kristen, or when I see the character in Scott, I think to myself, I want that. I want that. I want to go through a test like that and come out as strong as him. And I get inspired. Yeah. That was Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. Yep, thank you for asking. Yeah, absolutely. Our mercy to the world we live in is evidence that we've been shown mercy from heaven. Let me read that again. Our mercy to the world is evidence that we've been shown mercy from heaven. Look, the reality of this passage is that nobody on the planet loves God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? Right? Even just take the the way the lawyer summarized the law. Loving God, loving others. Nobody meets that. And we ourselves, um, we love our, the reality is we love ourselves so much that we hate our neighbors. That's what's going on. And that means that we have nothing to offer God here. We cannot come to him this morning and say, okay, I'll, you know, I, I have something to offer. We are bankrupt and crushed by the law of God that tells us to love him and to love others. But God sent his son, and God crushed his son. He crushed his, sh- his son to show us mercy. Jesus became poor so that we, you and I would be rich. Jesus was stripped naked so that you and I would be clothed. Jesus became homeless and was orphaned on the cross so that you and I would have a family. Jesus gave up his life so that you and I could have eternal life. And it, this is talking about, this is not talking about, only talking about life after, you know, like post-mortem life, after your de- death here. It's talking about a quality of life now that's, that grows into eternity like an eternal plant that's what he's talking about. We get that now. It's who we are. It's what we've got. We've got these, Paul says, we've got these treasures stored up in earthen vessels. These treasures that are to be given away, that are to be shared, that are to be used to bind up the brokenhearted, to be little Christs in the world around. This is who we are. And this changes, secondly, this mercy changes the way we look at the world. Let me, I'll, uh, let me uh, I'll pick it up in verse 33. He says, A Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. So we have this story of a Samaritan who finds a Jew beaten and robbed. That's the idea here. 
The Samaritans, as I'm sure many of you know, the Samaritans hated the Jews, and the Jews hated the Samaritans. This is a completely us versus them type of a culture. The Jews used to routinely pray against Samaritans in their daily prayers. You know, we, we've found records, recorded prayers, praying against the Samaritans. <laughs> That's how much they hated them. And here, Jesus puts a Samaritan right into the middle of this story of his. He chooses the most controversial figure that he can find to play the hero of the story. Why? He's showing us, I think, that mercy erases barriers. That's what I think. It re- I think, this is my take on it, this is what I want to pawn off on you, I think mercy restores humanity. I th- in fact, I think mercy has the greatest shot, mercy is the greatest shot at restoring humanity and restoring Seattle one life at a time. Notice that the Samaritan didn't try to convert the Jew to his way of thinking before he would help him. He didn't say first, hey, you know, you got to come worship where I worship and you got to think the way I do before I'm going to help you here. There was no quid pro quo, no conditions, no interest rate, no payment plans, nothing like that. See, mercy has the power to create a whole new kind of society in which socioeconomic status means virtually nothing. Things like power, race, status, money, they don't control us anymore. The way the world divi- carves mankind, uh, you know, humanity up and creates these divides and barriers and those types of things. Now we don't, we don't love people for our sake. We love people for their sake We love indiscriminately, or whether or not they can give anything back in return. That's the kind of love that we're talking about here. See, if you're, on the one hand, if you're a moralist, like both the priest and the Levite, you'll have zero motivation to to reach the lost world. Instead, you'll say, well, pick yourself up first and get yourself a job. You'll say things like that, or you'll think or feel things like that. Or, you know, God helps those who help themselves. Or, you, you'll, you, you know, whatever it is that we say. I'm, I'm getting these words from my own heart, by the way. So I'm not, I'm not picking on anyone. I'm, I've got a vault of this thinking in myself. And this passage has shined a light on it. And it, and it makes me squirm a, get, a bit. See, the motivation for this is not guilt, I'm not saying, look at all the money you've got, so go and give it to someone else and change them. I'm not saying that. that and, and by the way, I'm not saying that because it clearly does not work. I'm sure UGM will be able to tell you how much money our society has thrown at homelessness for it not to really have done much. I'm sure it's helpful to some degree, <laughs> you know. I'm sure it's not, but it's not the end-all be-all, is it? No. Only your own rags to riches story will motivate you from the heart. Only when you see that you're not much different, that you've got your own bro- you've got your own brokenness, that you're also medicating pain or prone to medicate pain, maybe just in some more, more social acceptable ways than others, right? We make things a moral issue, and they are. But remember, we've just been in, in Samuel, and 2 Samuel shows us a really interesting view of mankind that I think comes a step before the, mor- the morality question. Is there sin? Absolutely. We can never back away from that. Absolutely. Are we culpable for our decisions? Absolutely. Do we make the mistakes? Absolutely. Do we have to, do we, you know, are we sleeping in the beds that we have made? Yes, all of those things. And the Bible clearly says yes, 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 yes to all of those things. But there's a step behind that that says, but why do we do those things? Why am I prone to hurt people that I love? Why am I prone to think more of myself than others? Why do I keep making the same mistakes over and over again? Why is there something called addiction? Even though I know it's harming me, I keep going back. Why, 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 why? And in 2 Samuel, I think it's chapter 9, there's a story of a young man named Mephibosheth who becomes the poster child, the metaphor, I think, of the Old Testament that shows the problem with mankind. Mephibosheth is crippled from a fall 
A new king has taken over David's dynasty, has taken over for Saul's dynasty. And in those days, new dynasties would slaughter everybody from the old dynasty to make sure there was no rival kings going on. And so because Mephibosheth was in direct line to Saul, his nanny scoops him up to run and she accidentally drops him and he becomes permanently crippled. Permanently crippled. And David comes, he makes this profound and very theological statement. He says, I want to show kindness to Mephibosheth for, his, for Jonathan's sake. In other words, I'm going to be gracious to someone who's broken because of the record of someone else, because of the kindness and mercy of someone else. And if you know the storyline, if you've been with us through the series, you know that David would not be king unless Jonathan died first. Jonathan gave his life so that David could take up the throne. There would be no David or Davidic dynasty unless Jonathan had died. And so David, so here's, he na- because of this kindness, he naturally feels like giving back. It's very human. I want to be kind to someone I should be murdering in my culture and time. It'd be more prudent or wise or strategic to kill this person, but I'm going to be kind to them for the sake of his father. That is the Christian story. God has been kind to you for the sake of Jesus. That's the idea. Not because we've earned it, not because we've impressed him, but because Jesus impressed him, God says, I will now be kind to you. But how does the Bible show Mephibosheth's sin? Through a crippling fall. In other words, The reason we do morally bad things, the reason our ethics are so screwed up, the reason we make mistakes is because we're hurt. We've all been maimed in some way. And maybe your hurt manifests itself through some other way. But really, when we see someone stuck in addiction or lost or homeless, A a Christian needs to, at some point, gradually see, I'm looking in a mirror. I'm looking at myself. I'm broken. I'm hurt. And maybe I express my my hurt by following all the rules. So so I'm undetected. But you know, I'm, I'm hurt. I'm trying to save myself just like they are. I'm trying to medicate pain just like they are. I'm trying to do these things. But if you're a moralist like this priest and Levite, you'll never see that. And you might do some things that just kind of take the edge off and make you feel better about yourself, but it never works. If you're a sinner saved by grace alone, not your own merits, then you will feel very compassionate for messed up people. We sing, I will praise you, oh my redeemer. It implies that you've been redeemed by something that you couldn't save yourself from. I, th- I think in a sense, yes, we need to forget in the sense that we're forgiven for our sins. But I I think we need to keep the story close. None of us would be here if Jesus hadn't saved us, right? Isn't that what we have in common? We were lost, and none of us would be sitting here. None of us would be here unless Jesus interrupted us, encountered us, and saved us. So what do we do? Pray that your heart will be touched and transformed by the story of a man who risked it all and lost it all to save you. You, This is your, this little parable of the Samaritan. It's our story. Ask God to show you, truly show you, that you can't save yourself by following the rules or by whatever else that we might do to try to save ourselves, to make ourselves feel better. And then, and only then, enjoy the riches that he's lavished that he's lavished upon you. My point is, here's not what I'm saying, and I don't think this is what uh, UGM is saying. Get out there and do more stuff. I think first, number one, first, enjoy your own story. Don't forget where you were. Don't forget that it was Jesus who came and took you out, that cleaned and is still cleaning you up, that came and is still coming to get you, that penetrated and is still penetrating into the, he's still poking around in there. I mean, this sermon, I think probably, I'm feeling it. 
It's kind of out, not there, God. This is good. He disciplines those that he loves. Keep it close and let it and meditate on it. Pray about it. Talk to each other about your own story and the grace of God and the goodness of God. Stir each other up to enjoy the grace and the mercy of God. And then you will start to naturally have compassion on the poor, on others. On the one hand, this is not a either you have it or you don't. This is a something that we're growing in as we're following Jesus. But it starts by remembering who we are, remembering who you were, remembering who you are now, how you got there, and who God is turning you into. This is what we're, what we're here for. Are we causing as much of a ruckus as one man, Jesus, did when he came? Do we teach with authority, and are we meeting needs in radical, powerful, spirit-filled ways? That is what we're here. This is why God chose you in this time to be here in Seattle. We could have been, he could have chosen for us to be born at any other time in history and any other place. He chose you for this time, now, here, for this city, to deal with the current darkness going on here and to be lights here. We need not retreat. This is eternal life, and it starts now. I, um, I sat through a presentation with the Union Gospel Mission, and what touched my, I hope I'm not stealing your thunder, but what touched my heart so much um, was the presenter said, we offer not just resources, not just, but human resources, relationship, because that is the gospel, right? Jesus didn't drive by in his heavenly Tesla or whatever and throw us, you know, like drop care packages from the sky. He offered him, he offered us a relationship. And the presenter at Union, the Union Gospel Mission said that is, the, that is probably the resource that, that homeless lack the most as they've run out of family, they've burned bridges, they've, they, they're alone, essentially. People have died, uh, those types of things. And so it's one thing to give them something. It's another thing to say, Who are, what's your name? Tell me your story. Let me keep remembering you. Let me keep talking to you. We're, we're offering relationship, and it's mercy. It's baked into Christianity. Jesus came. You're not a Christian unless you know Jesus personally and are knowing him personally. I mean, it's not, about, it's not, it's not just doctrine. The doctrine's a means to the, it's important, but it's a means to knowing a person, to knowing a person. And that is what will give, that'll put the right gas in the engine of your heart to fuel you in the right direction. May we go there together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this hard-hitting parable. I pray, God, that you would stir us not through shame. I pray that no one feels shamed or less than, but rather convicted and therefore inspired. Lord, I pray that we would continue to know you by knowing our own brokenness and by enjoying your grace and your love for us. Lord, bless the rest of our worship service, and I pray that you'd bless us as we hear from the generous people who have dedicated their lives to the, to the gospel mission. Lord, I pray that they would feel that they've got um, more recruits today, more people joining the mission today. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and let's, let's have some worship. you feel comfortable, why don't we just close our eyes and just scan yourself. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Just be before the Lord. 
Maybe you feel a little bruised or cut a little bit. I just come before him. Holy Spirit, would you mend us today? Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for coming after, after us. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took his, with his friends, he took some bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you so that you can heal. By his stripes, Isaiah says, we are healed. Maybe we're feeling some wounds that we need some healing today. He said, eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it and said, this is my blood shed for the, new, for the covenant, shed for the forgiveness of sins. The sacrifice to end all sacrifice. Are you feeling the guilt or the shame? Jesus washes it away with his blood. You are righteous and clean. He knows you to the bottom. But he loves you to the sky. He's always seen the dark places, and yet he's not shied away. He wants more. He wants to come in even more. He's not embarrassed. It's going to clean. So when you feel ready, you can come up and you can partake of the communion elements. your face again. to come in yeah. 
And I will not point my finger or grow that wicked skin that cannot remember what I will not forget. How I broke you, or how I'm broken. So put in me what I cannot buy with gold. Put in me, oh God, come restore my broken soul. Put in me what I cannot give myself. Put in me, yeah. What I cannot buy with gold, put in me, oh God, come restore my broken soul. Put in me what I cannot give myself. Put in me a clean heart. I need a clean heart. Cause your mercy, it covers me wherever I go. And your kindness, it never ends, oh Lord. Ah. There's nothing I could do to change your mind. About me. Do you know that? There's nothing you could do to keep you from loving me, to keep you from wanting me, Jesus. Because your love it never fails. Your love it never fails. Your love it never fails me, Jesus. And mercy it covers your throne like a rainbow, like a rainbow. Here I find myself. In the sweetest embrace, it's a love that I could never earn. And it's only in this place that I am truly saved, surrendered to beauty and to your mercy. Your mercy, it covers me wherever I go. Kindness never ends. Your kindness, it never ends. Oh, Lord. There's nothing I could do. There's nothing I could do to change your mind. God, there's nothing I could do to change your mind. Yeah, there's nothing I could do to change your mind about me. Mercy flows from your throne, and mercy, it flows from your throne, like a river, like a river, here I find myself in the sweetest embrace, it's a love like I have never earned, and it's only in this place that I am truly saved, surrendered to beauty untold. Sing it out, your mercy. Your mercy, it covers me wherever I go. Your kindness, it never Nothing I could do to change your mind. 
No, there's nothing I could do to change your mind. God, there's nothing I could do to change your mind about me. You're a good, good father, and you love your children. You're slow to anger, abounding in love. You're so, so gracious, and oh, so merciful, how you love, how you love us all. love you. Bless our lunch. Lord, bless our friends from the Union Gospel Mission. May our hearts be bound to theirs. Inspire us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jameson, do you want to explain how we're going to do this here, or how do we, how do, we do this efficiently? Officially, <coughs> we can probably get a couple more people to help Dave bring stuff out to the table, but just like always, uh, we're just going to Form a line. Let's load up some plates. And we're going to sit here, right? We we're are going to sit here. You can sit in your chairs. Um, well, we're going. Are we going to set up tables? We can pull tables out too, I so you can grab your that. chair and sit alongside a table if you want. So, so. if you want to help us set up some tables and put chairs around yeah. them, we're going to set them up so we can still see the screen. Yeah. So if we want to set them up, they're in the back, I think, already. So we could get some yeah, help with that. Yeah, it's like and TV we'll, dinner, but lunchtime on Sundays. Yep. And instead of in your house, you're at church. Yep. So we'll start very soon. See you yeah. soon.